Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. In my small group on Thursday nights, I'm usually at the light switch or I assign somebody the light switch to flick it on and off, and that's the signal for everybody to get started. So the lights just went down and came back up to signal me to come up and start Equipping Hour. I was really angry about that. (laughs) So now we're going to have a Equipping Hour session on anger. Let's pray as we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to look into your word. And your word is a sharp two-edged sword. Wielded by your spirit in our hearts, it cuts through motives. It divides that which seems indivisible. It bores down deep with surgical precision. As we think about anger this morning together from your word, we pray that we would be guided that we would be convicted, that we would be encouraged, that we would be humbled by you, uh, that we might be exalted in the right ways in the right times. Lord, we ask for your help in this. Uh, We need your help for this very common ailment. Uh, We ask for that help in Jesus' name. Amen. This series in Equipping Hour has been some of my self-counsel done publicly. Uh, This morning is no different. I'll be talking to you about biblical anger, uh, biblical anger. I will be talking to you biblically about sinful anger. And uh, so this is something of of a confessional and an examination of my own heart and the mechanics of anger, uh, hopefully in a way uh, that will be helpful to you. And so uh, I, I am putting for public display what I have counseled to myself, sometimes successfully, Uh, and have given counsel to others, and hopefully we can all benefit from and be encouraged by this morning. This is a common sin, anger. Uh, I I would suggest to you that it's far more prevalent than we realize, especially when we take away the euphemisms, the nice names that we give to it, and we start to see it for what it is. Uh, When we take away the caricatures of anger, someone wildly thrashing about, and we begin to look at some of the more subtle forms of anger, I believe that we will see this in many more places than we are comfortable with. And that discomfort, I hope, will be a help for us to grow in godliness, to grow in Christ-likeness together. I want you to think for a moment about the last time that you were angry. And in the moment, that anger feels right. It feels so appropriate. It is the genuine, sincere, just, appropriate response to something that's wrong or someone who is stupid. If somebody does something and it's clear that they were not looking out for my interests in all the ways that I wanted them to. And so there is anger. Something happens that I don't think should happen. Some wrong has been done. And anger shows its ugly head. In the moment, we believe that we are justified in our anger. Perhaps we believe we are even righteous in our anger. It is an attitude, a disposition, a whole series of activities that we believe in the moment are appropriate. And and we've all been chagrined by the aftermath. It seemed so right in the moment to be angry. (laughs) And, And as the temperature cools... And the waves subside, we recognize the folly. Or we double down in more folly and defend the anger. In the moment, it just feels right. Did you receive slow service at a restaurant? Did your kid break another butter dish? Is the baby crying again? Did your neighbor's rocks get into your grass? Or did your neighbor's grass grow into your rocks? Did your sports teams fail you again? Are you a Dallas Cowboys fan? (laughs) Did someone mistreat you, malign you, ignore you, not make eye contact with you in the hallway when you expected them to? Are your employees lazy? Is your boss demanding? Is your spouse forgetting to give you everything you were thinking about wanting? Were you inconvenienced in some way? Traffic? Road closures? 
so mad I didn't get to equipping hour on time, I-10 was closed again. Traffic lights, inconsiderate drivers, drivers that seem not to have ever read the rules, how could they have possibly passed their driver's exam? The manifestations of anger are so common to us, and the experience of anger is so frequent that we tend to normalize and excuse it. I would suggest we have some digging to do. Anger is not something that happens to you. Anger comes from within. Anger stems from who you are, and anger is something you do. Anger flows from heart idols and from bad theology. Anger flows from self-importance and the blinding nature of pride. Anger flows from a failure to apprehend the gospel and to understand what we deserve and what we get instead. Anger flows from a lack of love. Turning your Bibles to James chapter 4. My wife, who was my fiance, and before that was my girlfriend, brought this text to my attention. It was a rather life-changing moment. She was uh, studying for a master's degree in biblical counseling, and, and she had some very good professors who were also some of my professors at the seminary level teaching biblical counseling there. And she and I were having a conversation. It's just a conversation. But the temperature was rising. There was one side and another side, and, and we were going back and forth, and, and my girlfriend, later fiance, thankfully, and finally my wife, said, do you know why we're arguing right now? And I said, I sure do. You said this, and then I said that, and you said this, and then I said that. And you clearly don't understand where I'm coming from. I was right. She was writer. She said, can we turn to James 4, 1? <laughs> oh, she's, she's that kind of girlfriend. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? My heart is just sinking in these moments. My head is down. She is so right, and I'm watching my life change before my very eyes. You lust and do not have, so you murder. Whoa, the stakes just raised here. What kind of murder is James talking about? Probably the same kind of murder Jesus talked about. Anger in the heart. You are envious and you cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. This just took a, a nosedive from, well, yeah, I, I lost my temper. I, I, I lost my cool. Uh, I, I, yeah, the temperature went up and I, I raised my voice and, and we were arguing and I got in my jabs. That's just a normal sparring match. That's what, that's what life is. That's how conversation works, right? And maybe that kind of approach to life has been modeled for you. Maybe you have driven that path for so long, you've put deep ruts in the ground, and you can't imagine conversations going any other way. For me in that moment, that James 4 moment was a revolution. Because the stakes just went from, I lost my temper and I raised my voice to what's underneath all of that. Conflicts and quarrels stemming from not getting what I want. And maybe not wanting the right things. Certainly not asking God for wisdom in my wants. Not asking for God's provision in my wants. And then even in discovering what my wants are, they are opposed to God as adulterous idolatries that make God mad. <laughs> Hostility with him. 
You go from a, a lack of faith to outright rebellion against God that is simmering under the surface that comes out in a conversation where it just seems like we're getting a little heated. Anger is far more severe, far darker, far more consequential than we give it credit. Again, anger, as we learn from James 4, is not something that just happens to you. It's not circumstantial. It's not external. It bubbles up from within. It bubbles up from a high view of self and a low view of God and a lack of love for others. I want to put up on the screen the, the outline, and uh, this, this will be part one of question mark. I, I had slotted next week's equipping hour to be on waiting on the Lord. You're going to have to wait on equipping hour because we're going to spend a couple weeks at least on anger. So here's, here's where we're headed. The posture of anger. We, we want to look at, at how we are holding ourselves in relationship to others when we are angry. The mechanisms of anger. What, what does it actually look like? How, how does it work? How does it work itself out? The effectiveness of anger. What does anger produce? Anger is effective for some things. It's ineffective for other things. We'll look at the folly of anger. We'll look at the opportunities of anger. What, what doors does anger open and for whom? We'll look at the prohibitions against anger in Scripture. We'll look at the roots of anger. Where does it come from? If you remember back to our discussion about repentance, we, we talked about the need not just to deal with the surface level sins or, or as we might describe the fruits on the extended branches of a tree, but we want to look at the branches on which those fruits are. What trunk does it come from? What kind of tree is this? And, and what are its roots into the ground? And what kind of soil is it sitting in? And we, we trace back the external fruit called anger to its connected sins and its theological roots, its personal roots, and then the soil of unbelief in which it sits. And then we'll talk about the theology of anger. What does anger say about what you believe about God? Anger actually reveals what you believe about anthropology, theology, soteriology, eschatology. All of these things are exposed in your anger. We'll look then at the opposites of anger. If we were to dig up anger and replace it with other stuff, what is that other stuff we need to put in its place? And then we'll look at the righteousness of anger. And, and you may be stewing in your juices right now, thinking, I can't believe he's going to talk about anger, and he's not going to give me a category for righteous indignation. I want that category, and I'm holding on to it with a white-knuckle grip, and you can have my righteous indignation when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. Maybe that was hyperbolic. Maybe you weren't thinking quite that far down the road. But if you are right now thinking, okay, I can disregard all this stuff about anger because I have this category called righteous indignation, I just want you to know that I intend to upend that thought. I know Ephesians 4.26 gives a command, be angry and do not sin. Uh, I think there are some grammatical things we need to look at there. Many of the pastors and commentators will carry that as an imperative, a command. Be angry. I don't think it fits like a command there. The grammarians, the, the, the Greek grammars, almost universally treat it as a concession. You'll be angry. Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on it. Satan gets a door. I think there's some things we need to consider there before we run after the model of Jesus. See, Jesus was angry, and I'm angry when people offend me too. We're going to at least give some parameters. I will concede the possibility that Ephesians 4.26 is not a concession. I believe it is a concession. But I'll concede for the sake of argument when we get there that it is a command. And then we'll still have to wrestle with what do you do with it. I do think it's out of place in Ephesians 4. And that whole new man conversation, putting off evil things and putting right things in its place to out of nowhere command Christians to be angry. Especially when the end of the chapter says, don't be. Getting ahead of myself. Just know, I, I have a category for righteous anger. We'll, we'll study it the next hour. 
In Revelation 14, God has never sinned, will never sin, and he will be far angrier than any of us are ever capable of. And yes, Jesus in his humanity was angry. But if you watch how many times Jesus was personally offended, sinned against, maligned, and mistreated, and did not respond in anger, that's the model we'll be following. So that's where we'll end is a discussion about righteous indignation and, and categories for that, how to think through it. So let's start with the posture of anger. Ed Welch has written a small book. It's actually called that. It's called a small book about a big problem. I'll commend that to you. In fact, I believe we're going to make that a, a recommended book of the month from the elders Uh, at the start of the year. But in Ed Welch's book, he describes the the, the posture uh, of what is going on in anger. Uh, I'm using the word posture to describe uh, what he's putting forward. But he says, you can have an attitude with anger that that believes that your anger is a legitimate response to stupid people. Uh, That's a quote from Ed Welch. Somebody does something that they're just not thoughtful. They clearly haven't thought about me in the way that I think about me. They haven't thought about me in the way I want them to think about me. They're terrible astronomers. They don't have me at the center of the universe. They've got it all wrong. They've inconvenienced me. They've made my life harder because they're stupid. That is an elevated view of self, an elevated superiority of self that is upset because someone else's actions adversely affect me. Another side of anger that that will consider an elevated posture is the response to people who wrong me. Some people are just stupid and they are inconveniencing my life and I'm angry. But other people wrong me and and we would put in the category wrong wrongs, right wrongs. In other words, the it, it may not actually have been wrong what they did, but I'm offended by it. Can I say it's wrong or actually it is a wrong and I respond in anger. And so Ed Welch describes a category of of thinking that it is a legitimate response to people who wrong me. And in this Welch says the angry person is judge. You have assessed the other person. You have determined that they have done you wrong. And now we have a courtroom scene. Anger is a courtroom where you are judge and jury and prosecutor. You might even be the the TV audience of of Judge Wapner's catalog. and, And everybody is against the defendant. Welch says relationships do not do well in a courtroom. Relationships do not do well in a courtroom. Judges are supposed to recuse themselves in trials because of their bias when cases involve personal offenses. But anger prosecutes what is personal. Anger takes up one's own cause. Anger sees... Look, no one's looking out for me. I got to look out for myself. God's not looking out for me. The other person's not looking out for me. I must take things into my own hands. So anger becomes plaintiff, prosecutor, judge, jury, uh, maybe even executioner. Welch says, whatever relationship once existed is now in flames. Perhaps if the accused accepts the judgment as infallible and shows sufficient remorse, the judge will give a lighter sentence. But we can be sure that another perceived infraction will bring more judicial wrath. The view that we sort of elevate ourselves, either in intelligence over somebody who's inconvenienced us, or a judge over somebody who has wronged us, We have made a a high view of self and a low view of others. Proverbs 21, 24 says this, Proud, haughty, scoffer are his names, who acts with angry outbursts. Some translations uh, list that as insolent pride, or the wrath of pride, or insolent fury, or proud wrath. 
And there's a connection in Proverbs 21, 24 between pride and anger. The idea is, I am better than you are. I have judged your inferiority. Or I am righter than you are, and I have judged your crimes. The posture of anger is a posture of superiority. It is not the assessment of one who says, I'm the chief of sinners. I will never get all the mistreatment that I deserve. I have only been shown grace and mercy in the gospel. It is one who has rights and seeks to enforce them. Let's look for a few moments at the mechanisms of anger. How does anger show itself? Anger can show itself by physical violence. With people, if you're angry, you can begin to posture. If you've uh, seen a, a scared kitten, the kitten goes sideways and big and all the hair puffs out and it's trying to throw its flimsy little weight around to intimidate someone else. A form of physical anger is just the posturing, bullying stances, closing the distance, getting proximity, and, and showing that you're tough, an attempt at intimidation. It can flow over into physical contact, pushing, hitting, throwing things, different kinds of physical violence, employing weapons as threats or actual implements of physical harm. And in Cain's case, it turned to murder. The end result was Abel's blood on the ground. Anger can manifest itself physically when no other people are around. Uh, who's the stupid person if there's physical violence but not people? Some inanimate object. Some project that's not cooperating. You know, when the, the school projects do the next morning and, and dad found out that, okay, we've, we've got to build a volcano and it's 10 p.m. <laughs> Why won't this paper mache cooperate? <laughs> okay, it, um, it's now Mount St. Helens. We're just going to pretend the, the volcano already blew up. <laughs> Things can be broken, smashed, squeezed, thrown I have in my tool drawer in, in my garage a drawer that I, I think I might be the only one besides the Lord who knows what that drawer is. That drawer is a trophy case of a lack of self-control. It's a really nice Matco screwdriver that's bent. No longer usable. It's not a person. <laughs> Just a really expensive Phillips screwdriver <laughs> that I can't use for its intended purpose anymore because it didn't cooperate and oh, I'm not boasting in my strength. I had leverage. There was length involved. It's not shaped the way it used to be shaped. And maybe there are trophies of your anger. Holes in drywall. Broken things, dents, things that have been kicked, squeezed, thrown. Aside from physical violence, there is also the vocal violence. And there's a spectrum in this kind of anger. It can go from low to high. Thoughts in here turn to lips moving, but inaudible utterances. And then grumbling to mumbling, sputtering to muttering, leading to cursing under the breath, to cursing out loud, yelling, screaming. It's somewhat entertaining to see on YouTube some of the, the rants that happen. You know, somebody will be uh, just filming somebody in a road rage incident where the, the person is banging their head on a steering wheel, yelling at the top of their voice, perhaps hoping not to be seen, but out of control, giving vent to rage, going hoarse. 
It's tragically entertaining to watch people broadcast those things on purpose. I want to vent and I'm not ashamed. So I will yell into my phone and then broadcast it to the world. This vocal violence when one is alone has the consequence of a sore throat, maybe a bump on the forehead from hitting a steering wheel violently. But when it is done in the context of other people, it brings harm, sometimes irreparable harm, breaks down relationships. Another mechanism for anger is silence. The sullen and vexed Jonah. Turn, turn to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah is one of the minor prophets. In my Bible, he starts on page 1243. I don't know what page he starts in yours. Short book. Um, Minor prophet doesn't mean that he was young uh, or that he sung his song in a sad tune. He's in a minor key. Although I think that one applies here to Jonah. Look at Jonah chapter 4 verse 1. This was a great evil to Jonah and he became angry. What was a great evil to Jonah? Verse 10. God saw the works of the... Ninevites, the Assyrians, they turned from their evil way and God relented the evil that he brought upon them. And Jonah said, that's evil. (laughs) Evil that sinners would repent and that God would forgive. Jonah was angry. You can already see he has an elevated position over those dirty, rotten Assyrians. He has an elevated position even over the Lord's mercy. And he's angry. He doesn't like how things have turned out. And he prayed to Yahweh in his anger and said, Oh, Yahweh, isn't this what I told you would happen? That's why I went to flee to Tarshish. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger. And that makes me angry. One who relents concerning evil, abounding in loving kindness. So now Yahweh, kill me. Just take my life now. Death is better for me than repentance from anger and life and joy in the repentance of sinners. Angels rejoice when one sinner turns. Jonah doesn't have that joy. He just has anger at God. Yahweh said, do you have good reason to be angry? Jonah went out from the city. There's no response. This is just a sullen and vexed response. He sat. And there he made a booth for himself. He sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. Maybe God will relent of his relenting (laughs) and torch them. Yahweh God appointed a plant. It came up over Jonah to be a shade over his head and to deliver him from his miserable evil. And Jonah was extremely glad about the plant. His heart hasn't changed, but his circumstances have gotten better and he likes it. God appointed a worm at the breaking of dawn the next day. It struck the plant and the plant dried up. It happened as the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun struck down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and asked with all his soul to die and said, death is better to me than life. God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Jonah here has gracious interactions with Yahweh, and he doubles down in his anger. Yahweh said, you had pity on the plant. You had fond affections for the plant, which you didn't work for. You didn't cause to grow. It came to be overnight and perished overnight. Should not I have compassionate affections or pity on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons not knowing the difference between right and left hand, as well as many animals. Does not God have a right to be kind? And Jonah, you're angry about it. Now you and I might look at Jonah and think that is totally irrational anger. Think about the last few times you've been angry. Is it rational? Does it make sense? 
Do you have a right to plants and shade and happiness and the demolition of all your enemies for your own satisfaction? Do you have a right to those things? Not a bit. God is kind. He evidences his kindness to Jonah as an illustration, a tangible parable of his kindness to enemies who hated God and acted immorally and wickedly and persecuted God's people, but God was kind to them, forgave them, gave them hearts to repent, and they did. And Jonah should have been happy. He was angry. And that anger manifested itself in a number of ways. But, but interesting that he walked away and sat down. He's not breaking things. <laughs> He's not yelling. He's sitting sullen and vexed. Another mechanism of anger is the silent treatment. If somebody makes you angry, you just don't talk. You clam up, shut down, short answers. You're sending signals that you are not to be talked to at the moment. There is the severer punishment of exile. You exile yourself. You, you go to that room and you shut the door. Or you exile others. You make life uncomfortable so that they leave. You tell them to leave. Shut the door and lock the bolt. And the, the tragedy of silent treatment or exile as a mechanism of anger is we think in those moments that being away from the cause, being away from the circumstance will, uh, will allow me to no longer be angry. And the problem is you took it with you. If you went away, you took your heart with you. If you sent them away, uh, they didn't take your heart. You kept it. You will stew with it. Sometimes anger is expressed unmistakably. Like, we just know that's anger because the person said, I'm so angry right now, I could suck night crawlers out the ground. I think that's a Texas thing. Or, I'm so mad, I could pinch your little head off. Maybe you never heard that one. Sometimes anger is just this open hostility. I am angry. I am mad. I am so mad right now. It just admits it. it maybe it comes with the open verbiage of hostility, a, a confession that you're hostile. Maybe it comes with the fierce looks, jabs and angry words, threats. Maybe it comes with physical violence. But sometimes anger is expressed more discreetly. You can camouflage anger under a smile. You can camouflage anger under cool tones and controlled verbiage. You can camouflage anger with biting humor. Sort of sound like a joke, but that stung a bit. Passive aggressive comments. You know, I want to say something, I want to give vent to how I'm feeling, and I want you to feel the sting of it, but I want to say it in such a way that I can deny it later. I didn't say that. that that's not what I meant. But you know very well you meant it in the moment to cut, to hurt. Ambiguous but deniable jabs. Anger can camouflage itself in Cold, calculating revenge. Sometimes anger is expressed euphemistically. I'm not angry. I'm just saying is all. I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. I'm concerned. I'm just moody. I'm tired. I'm just being honest. We're going to call a spade a spade. We're, we're just going to put everything on the table here. I'm just going to say it like it is. Sometimes those euphemisms are camouflaging anger. But we can't admit to being anger, angry, that would be wrong. So we have other words to describe it. Ed Welch gives a list of some of the ways anger works itself out. He, he describes sarcasm as anger. Uh, the kind of sarcasm that intends to tear down, but then says, I, I was only joking says it in such a way that it could be taken as a joke. 
He describes grumbling as anger, and, and the grumbling is, I want something that I'm not getting. When we talk about the idolatries and the theologies underneath anger, we will talk about this. What are you, what are you wanting that you're not getting? What is the gap between your expectation and reality? What is the circumstantial situation that is revealing an idol? And listen, you can want what you're not getting and the want be a good thing. And you can want what you're not getting and the want be a bad thing. Either category is still idolatry. Either category is fertile soil for anger. Gossip is a form of anger. If we think about anger as the the judge declaring rights and wrongs, then gossip is the judge who publicizes his verdict and tries to convince others to pronounce the same verdict, according to Ed Welch. Withdrawal is a, another manifestation Welch lists. That is, you remove your kindness. Maybe you remove your very presence from the offender until she makes it right. Indifference, he says, is the worst form of this anger. It means something like you're dead to me and I just don't care about you anymore. It's writing off the other person in your anger. Well, it's just too much to, to love, too much to endure. I'm just going to be done with this person. Envy is the anger that says, I want what you have. And jealousy is the darker form of it that says, I deserve what you have. I think those are helpful windows from Ed Welch into sort of putting some teeth to anger, helping us see what it truly is. Anger does not always express itself in physical violence or in verbal assaults. It is an underlying heart disposition that can run silent and deep. Listen to Proverbs 29, 22. An angry man stirs up strife and a hot tempered man abounds in transgression. What does that mean? Anger has consequences in other relationships and anger has company. Lots of other sins go along with it. Let's talk about the effectiveness of anger. Anger is highly effective. Anger is a a really wonderful tool. By wonderful, I don't mean good morally necessarily. I mean, wow, we wonder at its ability. It really is amazing. You've been the victim of anger and you've been affected by it. Anger has had an effect You've been the prosecutor of anger, and it has had effects. People will do what you say when you raise your voice. You you can get things done with anger. A sharp tone, raised voice, increased volume, and people snap to attention. Whoa, (laughs) what's going on? I guess I better pay attention to this. And and this is the sort of the go-to fallback mode for parenting. And I'm not intending to indict everybody that's been a parent or everybody that will. Um, but, but I've been a child of parents and I've been a parent to children. And, and I know how easy this is. You, you give an instruction one time. It's really, really wise instruction. You even back up that instruction with the instruction about instruction. Listen, kid, your job, it's on your job description. It's on your business card. Obey God, obey mom and dad. That's your task. Things will go well with you if you do that. So... You've laid the groundwork, following mom and dad's instruction is wise. Here, mom and dad are giving an instruction, and you're not heeding wisdom. Just at the basic level of following instructions, good, and you're a kid, and you don't know what life's about, and mom and dad have been there. Like, you should just follow instructions. And you're not heeding this specific instruction. There's a way that seems right to you, kid, but the end is death. And you disobeyed again? So my instruction about instruction hasn't worked and my specific instructions haven't worked. And I've given now I'm going to give you to three, I'm not recommending that as a strategy. <laughs> we, we, we get impatient as parents. And so the tone of voice goes up, volume goes up, the, the eyebrows go down, the stern looks happen. And then there's an outburst and the kid goes, I guess I need to make my bed. And the bed gets made lickety split. And what do we think? Oh, that worked. 
That was effective. Yes, that was effective. Fear motivates. Others around us, when we're angry, may be very familiar with the proverb that a gentle answer turns away wrath. I'm going to walk on eggshells called gentle answers because I don't want the wrath. And people learn. People learn to be a different situation. They learn to be a different circumstance so as not to provoke. And, and the people around you have learned to accommodate. They've, they've evolved. I don't know that that's helpful. They may learn to slink away and hide and avoid. One songwriter wrote, when she goes storming out, I run for cover. Watch the people around you. Is your, is your anger effective? Do they snap to obedience? Do they listen up? Do they exercise care so as never to cross the threshold which will provoke the ire? Have they learned your behaviors and changed their behaviors to accommodate? Your anger can be very effective. But let's think about the effects that anger produces. We, we, we might have the pragmatic approach. Uh, anger is going to shortcut all this process of patient, loving, careful, diligent, self-controlled instruction, uh, correction, whatever, the, whatever is the need of the moment, and I can very quickly get what I want. But I would suggest to you that you get far more than what you bargained for. One of the effects of anger is provocation. Listen to Proverbs 15, 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. Hot-tempered man stirs up strife. More anger, more strife, more people involved. You got quarrels in you. We, we looked at James, what's causing it. And now you're introducing that quarrel to others. Production of more anger. The converse of that in Proverbs 15, 18 is, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. Easy to anger, ramps it up. Slow to anger, calms it down. You also get multiplication. Proverbs 19:19. 19, 19. A man of great anger will bear the penalty, for if you rescue him, you will only have to do it again. If you don't learn to replace anger with its biblical replacements, if you don't learn to kill anger by the leading of the Spirit, mortify it, put it to death, if you haven't learned the theology underlying your anger, if you haven't learned to mortify the pride beneath it, you might solve a circumstance, but you will be angry again and again and again. And you will break things and you will break people. Proverbs 19.19 19 says, even if he's rescued, he'll have to be rescued again and again. There's another effect of anger we can't overlook, and it is isolation. Isolation. An angry person eventually will be alone. Proverbs 21, 19, it is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. Contentious and vexing woman will drive people away. Proverbs 22, 24, do not associate with a man given to anger, nor go with a hot tempered man. There's a command from wisdom to leave that guy. Don't be around him. A natural consequence is people will leave you, and even the command of wisdom is don't associate. Let's consider the folly of anger. Turn to Proverbs. <clears throat> In fact, all of, the, all of the Proverbs on anger uh, could be slotted in this category of wisdom versus folly. Turn to Proverbs 14. And we, when we get to anger's opposites, one of the opposites of anger we will list is simply that, wisdom. Anger on one side, wisdom on the other. <clears throat> Listen to Proverbs 14, 17. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly. There's an equal sign between a hot temper, short fuse, and 
folly. And you must remember that folly in Proverbs, the fool, the foolish one, is not a, not a clown, not, a, not, a, not an entertainer that's just doing silly things that we all laugh, laugh at, not some sort of cute foolishness. But the, the fool in Proverbs is the one who has spurned God's wisdom and given his life over to self-destruction. He has made himself an enemy of God and is headed for death. So when the Bible says a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, the, the, the man with the short fuse is one who behaves like the fool in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs 14, 29. He who is slow to anger has great discernment, but he who is quick-tempered raises up folly. Uh, the, the idea of raising up there is the exaltation of folly. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and let's go to the next portion of our outline, the opportunities of anger. We've already said that anger loves company. What accompanies anger is a whole host of other sins. In Ephesians 4:26, we have here, I believe, the confession You'll be angry. Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And notice verse 27. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Anger opens a door. Anger opens a door to Satan. To his schemes. To his desire to murder relationships. His desire to break things apart. Anger opens the door. Opens The opportunity for that. That ought to sober us. That it's not just a normalized activity we can participate in without consequence. Anger is scary stuff. Let's look at the prohibitions against anger. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. There are many. We will not exhaust these. In the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Like many of the elements of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus overturns normal human behavior. Exposes it for the dark stuff that it is. All of this would have been. Shocking teaching. Listen to verse 21. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. This comes right out of the Decalogue, right out of the Ten Commandments. Everybody knows this one. Don't murder. But I say to you, says the word of God in flesh who wrote the Ten Commandments, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Murder is guilty before the court. Angry with his brother, guilty before the court. And then whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. This raised the stakes. I am... I have been very quick with the phrase, you idiot. (laughs) It's a movie line. I'm quoting a movie line in traffic with somebody with whom I'm angry because they've inconvenienced me and they're bad astronomers and didn't put me at the center of the universe. I don't think I, I don't think I get off the hook here in Matthew 5, 22. Casual name-calling here brings about guilt worthy of eternal torment in the fires of hell. Sometimes I think we've relegated this idea of anger to outbursts that everybody could say, oh, that guy's angry. Give him room. And we've missed Jesus' words here that stem from the heart and end up with Mutterings under the breath, derogatory of people. 
Listen, the, the name calling is keeping company with murder here in this. And anger kills relationships. It's a, a relational murder. Turn to Ephesians 4. Verse 31. Let 42% of your bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be put away from you. I I don't think that's what it says. Let all bitterness, let all anger, let all wrath, let all shouting, let all slander be put away from you along with all malice, ill intent. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you. Turn to Titus chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Slander no one, Paul says. Be peaceable, considerate, Demonstrating all gentleness to all men. And then notice this look back to pre-gospel days. For we ourselves also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Spending our life in malice and envy. Despicable. Hating one another. This is one of those vice lists in the New Testament where it, it tells us all the the dirty deeds we were rescued from and all the dirty deeds to avoid as Christians and all the dirty deeds that end up in the lake of fire. And there are a number of these vice lists in the New Testament. <clears throat> Romans 1 gives us one, beginning in verse 28. He's talking about the downward cycle of depravity. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things which are not proper. And then he lists a bunch of those. Unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. There's a whole bunch of anger words in that list. Galatians 5, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Then listen to this. Enmities, strife, Jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. Those are all anger words. Things like these which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to Romans 12. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind. Associate with the lowly. Don't be wise in your own estimation. And listen to what follows. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath. That is God's wrath. Overcome evil with good. Give your enemy a drink. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love is not provoked. Love is not provoked. Colossians 3, 8. Put all these aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. 2 Corinthians 12, 20 and 21. I'm afraid, Paul says of the Corinthians, that when I come, I may find you not to be what I wish. I may, found, I may be found by you, not what you wish. Perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. I'm afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you. I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, or sensuality which they have practiced. Lord willing, next week we'll begin to unpack the roots of anger. Listen, it's enough for us to hear from the Lord, don't do it. But I think it's going to be helpful for us to sort of examine what's underneath it. So that we're not just lopping off fruit at the outer branches. 
We'll begin to dig deep and see where it comes from. Will you advance to the very last slide? I have some resources up on the screen for you. And you can take a picture of these uh, if you'd like. Um, These are a handful of books. I really like italics on book titles. I don't know why they don't translate to the the slides. Um, At any rate, Lou Priolo is the author. And the title is The Heart of Anger, Practical Help for Prevention and Cure of Anger in Children. Ed Welch has written a small book about a big problem, Meditations on Anger, Patience, and Peace. Robert Jones, Uprooting Anger, Biblical Help for a Common Problem. Rick Horn has a book titled Get Out of My Face, How to Reach Angry, Unmotivated Teens with Biblical Counsel. So you have a spectrum there of of helping children with anger, helping teens with anger, uh, uprooting anger from your own heart. Uh, I would give uh, one more book recommendation, and it is Proverbs for Parenting, which is just a delightful book. And all it is, is the book of Proverbs assembled topically as a handbook for parents for how to help their kids be wise. And it's got a chapter on anger. The, the sneaky fact about Proverbs for Parenting, it, it's really just Proverbs for Parents. <laughs> It's an indictment. I see some heads nodding. If you've read it, you've thought, yeah, I'm going to get this book to straighten my kids out. Ooh, I'm pretty crooked. I need some straightening. It's a helpful tool. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the exposure. Thank you for rawness of conscience, tenderness of our sentiments this morning as we look at anger. As we examine it, God, we pray to be overwhelmed by your love, transformed by your grace, with hearts full of mercy, eager for reconciliations and forgivenesses and peace as far as it depends on us. We want to turn from anger, mortify anger, uh, to see a work of your grace in our lives that would please you. And would build up rather than tear down. That would unify rather than divide. We long for these things in our own hearts, O Lord. Would you be pleased to do such a work? In Jesus' name, amen.